for you. Um, yeah, uh, uh, first of all, a little bit about myself. Um, by training, I'm actually, uh, I study environmental toxicology. Um, so what does that mean? That means I study the environment and uh, how that how the, the things that we put into the environment can harm the environment and how they can, how those things can also hurt us. Uh, so this is a picture of me. Uh, I do a lot of work in Haiti, um, a fair amount of work in Nigeria, a lot of work now in, in West Africa. Um, also, you know, Australia, the Bahamas, Costa Rica, anywhere that's warm, I'm, I'm willing to go. I have no, um, no current projects in Norway, Iceland, or anywhere terribly cold. Um, I would go there, I suppose, but I kind of like the warm stuff. Uh, I didn't start, I, I mean, let me back up and say that I am, I loved when I was in, when I was in school, I loved biology and chemistry. That's what I studied. I, um, I was always a science nerd, I guess, uh, but I really fell in love with public health uh, and that's what I'm a professor of here. Interestingly, though, um, I am not a traditional professor. While I was getting my doctoral degree, I should say that just a little more context, not that, that this is super helpful, but I don't come from a family of business people. I don't come from a family of capitalists. I, I was adopted when I was 11. And I was adopted by a Presbyterian minister. Um, and uh, so I didn't have any business background in my family whatsoever, none. And I mean zero. Uh, but when I went to get my doctoral degree, I was the kind of guy, I was an environmental guy. I mean, I was, a, I was long hair, granola eating, Birkenstock wearing, uh, Prius driving, actually, this was before Prius came out, but, um, you know, I was a tried and true, chained myself to a tree environmentalist. I'd been arrested twice for chaining myself to trees that were being cut down. That's how I was. And that's how I am on the inside. On the outside, I look like a crunchy, short hair, you know, capitalist. But on the inside, I'm a granola eating environmentalist. And I was studying environmental health in my doctoral uh, degree. And, uh, and I realized um, there was an an opportunity with the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 that had just come out, just had, had just come out to, to really, in my mind, to help companies operate in a way that was not just more environmentally friendly, but actually to help them make more money. And I gave a talk, I gave a lecture, uh, and the long, the really long story short is that a person was in that audience who says, who basically said, my company could use your help. And I'm like, wait a second, you're like the evil empire. Like, it's like the Luke, I'm your father. Luke, I am your father. Moment, you know, where it's like, wait a second, I don't think I want to work with you. You're the dark side. But I, I had a conversation with this individual and then subsequently with the company. And I realized that uh, what I had could offer them a lot of value. And in the knowledge that I possessed in the, the innovation that I had been working on was actually um, something that they could get value from, but also do a lot of good in the environment. And so, I was at this, this place where I'd always envisioned that I would be, you know, an academic and I would just be a professor and I would innovate and that would just be enough. That would be enough. I would do that and I would do, I would do a lot of good in the world. Um, increasingly through my academic journey, I realized that that was not really the case. Is I'm not saying that that isn't done. I'm just saying for me, I, I couldn't see how I was going to maximize the good that I could do by just um, by only writing papers and innovating and hoping other people adopted my, my innovation. So during my doctoral degree as a young, I want to say I was 26 or so uh, year old, I, I started a company and um, 
And that company grew to be ultimately a, a fairly sizable company uh, that, that helped m- uh, a large number, about 378 of the Fortune 500 companies reduce their environmental footprint. Uh, subsequent to that, um, I, I've started I've started uh, well over a dozen companies. Um, I've sold, I've started them, sold them, you know, done, done different things. But I've always used this operating system of capitalism to to do the good that I want to do in the world. And this in in the Brown School or in other places uh, like it is a, a bit of an anathema, or at the very least, a paradox. I look at capitalism as an operating system. I have an iPhone. My son has a, an Android. My daughter has something else. I don't know. These are just operating systems. And they all, they all can work and they can all be bad. So communism, socialism, feudalism, capitalism, these are all operating systems. It's about how we leverage those operating systems to do good. And so what I try to do is to look at this operating system and say, how can I operate within it to maximize good? So um, a little bit about the type of professor I am. I'm a professor of what we call a professor of practice. It doesn't mean that I don't have uh, an academic pedigree. I actually, I I have a you know, kind of a, I don't want to say if it's traditional, but I have a, a master, two, a couple of master's degrees, a doctoral degree, all that, all that sort of stuff. But I developed my expertise in the, uh, in the practice area. I, I owned companies, like I said, and um, I was also happened to be in the United States Army. And so I was, um, you know, developed some expertise there uh, as well. But here at the Brown School and at universities kind of at large, what we should be is um, in this space here, we have existing theory, this is what I call the books. And we have emergent theory, that's the journals, that's the stuff that we develop. We're, we're out there doing science and we're, we're pushing and testing the stuff that's in the books and developing new theory. And the existing theory informs the emerging theory. And the existing theory and the emerging theory inform praxis or, or the practice of our disciplines. And the practice of our disciplines informs the emerging theory and uh, pushes back against existing theory. And in the center of this, this nexus, this area where these three things um, meet, that's where we should be as a university. And that's where we should be as programs. And that's where I hope I am as a, as a professional. I spend a lot of time in the field out doing what I do, but I spend a lot of time uh, hopefully developing new ideas and uh, testing old ones. And uh, so, so I hope that wherever you go and whatever you choose to do academically, uh, understanding this is likely not your only option, uh, that, that you should tr- hopefully identify a place that's committed to, those, to all three of those domains not individually, but incorporating them all into one another. Because I think just as a commentary that um, focusing too much on the vocation, the praxis, or too much on the theory uh, does a disservice to the the people that we ultimately are going to serve. So that's where you'll find me. If you come visit me, you'll find me right in that little happy space, hopefully. Couple of disclaimers. Um, I'm not always right. Um, I like to think I'm right, but if there's anything I say that you want to challenge or push push against, go right ahead. Um, we can break some rules here. This is this is just also in this little talk, but also in in our classes and in our lectures. And we should feel comfortable. A university is a marketplace of ideas, and um, and the, the marketplace uh, should decide the validity and veracity uh, of those ideas. Um, we could say, I could say some things, you could say some things that we don't, uh, that, that could be wrong. And, and the reality is that we might even say things that we don't believe just to see 
what happens? All this is um, the way it should be, in my opinion. So all that's to say, I'll start this by saying I'm biased. The truth is, is that we're all biased. Anybody who says they're not biased is, is lying to themselves. We all are biased and that's okay. As long as we recognize that there's a possibility that I'm looking at the world through, uh, through lenses or through a perspective that others may not have and, and may not be indicative of how the rest of, of humanity experiences that reality. My bias is that business uh, can be good and that the profit motive and profit is not a bad thing. I also, from my experience, and this is a pretty vast experience of working with thousands of companies, uh, is that most companies don't, most people in companies don't do bad things because they're, they're bad people. Um, a lot of times it's a function of ignorance uh, and uh, incentive structures or, or, and regulatory structures that, are, that compel certain behaviors um, that are, that are that would be human nature. And so uh, I, I come at this from a, a biased lens of saying that business is good. And uh, I have my evidence to support that. And I, and I had a whole big chunk of this presentation that I took out substantiating that claim. Happy to discuss that if, if you want to. So I wanna pick a problem, just a, a really simple sort of, of issue. It's in the news a lot right now is when we talk about a, a need, and that need is for transportation and the current um, infrastructural paradigm in the United States and in other countries uh, favors motorized transportation, motorized transportation of uh, particularly right now of, uh, of fossil fuel. Um, and so we have a, uh, we have here, a need for oil, for gasoline to make to make our cars go. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of a terrible joke. I'll share with you. I'm a dad. I have three kids. I told my kids the other day that the St. Louis Art Museum was robbed. Um, and my, my daughter, an art, art fan, says, oh, my gosh, it's terrible. I said, don't worry. They, they caught the guys. They caught the people who did it. And she said, oh, that's good. And I said, yeah, it, it turns out that they, um, that the robbers, uh, the getaway guy, the getaway van, he, he forgot to bring the Monet to buy the gas to, to make the van go. So that's um, my dad joke for the day. I, all right, I'll show myself out. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, thank you, Audrey. Thank you. I need that validation. Um, so how do we make our cars go? Well, let me, let's talk through the process of getting that oil to our car. And the only thing I'm concerned about, most consumers are concerned about is getting to work, getting to the places they need to go. So the way this works is that I, I have an oil exploration company and I drill, okay? There's costs with that and I need to make some, some money for that. I pass that on to um, uh, refiners and storage companies. They refine it and store the oil. Um, and there's transportation here that they, those make money and, and these people make money and they get it to the gas station and they make money. And then uh, you pay your money and then you get the value. This is the value. The value is created here. The value is you getting to work. The value is me getting to, to uh, go see that, that yellow warbler that I just uh, heard in, in Michael's uh, back, backyard or background. And so, that's where the value is created. And then all this other stuff is the cost. And so uh, right now, what's, what is this cost? Does anybody, where, where you're at, wherever you're at, I, mean, I don't know where people are at, but wherever you're at, what's that cost? Can I ask, Michael? What, like what do you have? Six bucks. Six bucks per? Per gallon. Gallon, got it, okay. Three, eight, seven. 387 in Kansas you're in Kansas where the, yeah. yeah yeah in the Midwest we have lower much lower gas taxes and I think most states in the Midwest have like waived their gas taxes so what a, what a big difference but so does it cost is the cost 
387, what's the, what's that cost represent that $6, that 387, whatever it, the, does it represent the, the gas station cost? Yes. And the transportation? Yes. And the, the regulatory permitting? Yes. Does it cost, does it cover this cost, this cost, this cost? Yes. Are all the costs then, what are the costs here? All these costs are accounted for 387 and you get that value. The reality is, is that that's not the cost. The cost is, is here. This is where I work in Nigeria. This is in the Delta state of Nigeria. You can't really see that, but that, the reason it looks kind of white and shiny is because that little stream is, is really just oil. <laughs> it's covered with oil. This is the, the, so we have an environmental cost here. The fisheries in the, in the Niger Delta, where you have poisoned fish, where you have um, uh, a fish that, that people are eating and, and fisheries that people are uh, trying to make a living from are badly damaged. High, 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 high rates of cancer in these areas, um, particularly blood cancers from benzene here. This is a, a picture I took in, in a town in Indiana, Whiting, Indiana, uh, where there's a refiner and they had a, they, they're always flaring. I'm always amazed at how much they, they're, they're flaring. Um, and living next to that community um, in that area, the, the incidence of childhood asthma is um, about 1.7 times greater than it is just uh, across upwind from that factory. Uh, this is a cleanup job that we did in um, one of my companies had, had done, uh, I can't remember, when, I, I think it was Tennessee, but this was an old gas station and um, this was an underground storage tank. And clearly the gas station closed um, many years before. This is now water. That means that whatever oil or gasoline that was in there is in the groundwater. And so we have that environmental cost. This area here is an area uh, of the Bahamas. What you can't see is this area here where this little dock was, actually um, that was a little island, it's gone now. Gone. We've only had six inches of sea level rise, but when you uh, put that and amplify it in waves, um, you know, when, when, if six inches of sea level rise, if you, if you have six inches of sea level rise and your average wave height is a foot, then actually your average wave height is going to be upwards of two feet because of the way that wave action works. And so it, 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 in my lifetime, since I started going here, that little island has been wiped out. Those are all costs that aren't factored in oftentimes or completely factored in to the cost structure of that 387. These are called externalities. The people that are not party to that transaction, the people here on Andros Island, where I, this area where I, where I go, they don't drive. They don't have any cars, but they bear the cost of the, the environmental damage um, that, that I am doing by driving a gas-powered car. The people down uh, that are pulling from the water or the well that has been contaminated with, with all sorts of petroleum products, they, they don't benefit from me driving to work, but they bear the cost. Same way with the kids who get asthma and the, and the families that are, are dealing with um, blood cancers in Nigeria. So who pays for externalities? It's, it's usually not built into the price structure of the goods or services that we buy. Or if it is, it's usually poorly done. So how do we, um, in, how do we impact the, these non-direct costs in or what we would call externalities 
and affect change. What's one thing we can do? I'm, I'm curious if, if you would feel comfortable answering or offering an answer. What's one thing we do or that we can do to impact these non-direct costs? Taxes, cap and trade. Taxes. Yeah, taxes, uh, cap and trade, which uh, is a, a, another uh, way to create a market for uh, pollution or other things. So yeah, these, these are some of the ways. Um, what we want to do is we have to understand what the hard dollar cost of externalities are. Ayn Rand, or I don't know how you pronounce it. I, some people pronounce it Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, whatever, wrote Fountainhead, Antlers Shrugged, really uh, the movement uh, of the free market capitalists. Um, the, the real true free market capitalism um, just wants the market to operate by itself. Um, so I, I'm a biology guy. Uh, you can tell by my shirt, I love birds. Everything I've done in life basically is a ruse to go bird watching. Um, but uh, when you study biology, you understand that there are there are regulators within biological systems, and those regulators, whether they be hormonal, whether they be um, uh, you know just natural um, feedback loops that inform the system when it's getting overheated in one area or the other. So when you understand biology and you see how that works, it's really easy to see how poor of a job we do in capitalist markets in regulating some of uh, some of the externalities and some of the uh, unintended consequences. It's hard to do, but it can be done. And then we need to build those um, those costs in through taxation. And there's a couple of ways you can actually do this. It's, it's one is through taxation. The other one is through subsidy, um, the, the opposite. But um, with taxation, you can, you can have graduated taxes um, and they can, you know, you, we see that where it's like, if you use X, you pay Y. If you use two times X, you pay two and a half times Y. If you use three times X, you pay 10 times Y. The other way that, um, you know, as Michael just said, is through, uh, through permitting or licensing where like the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, which was the law that got me started in business. What they do is they, they say, look, businesses are going to pollute, we're going to permit you to pollute, and you're going to, you're going to have a permit that allows you to pollute under these rules. And when you do that, you, you pay for that permit. And, um, and then we can use that. When you do that, and this is the beauty of, and this is, I still think was in the, is in the realm of capitalism, even though I think strict free market capitalists would disagree with me, those now the full burden of cost is put into the service or product through taxation. And, and when you do that, it will increase the cost. It will increase the cost of that, that service or product. And, and leave room open for innovation. The problem when, when we oversubsidize or when we allow legacy businesses that have built efficiencies in from previous subsidies, say for example, oil, the current electrical system, those are all, those are all built and they're benefiting from cost structures that are 50, 100 years old when labor was much cheaper and so on and so forth. And so now they get the benefit of having these assets in place and they can now deliver that good or service a lot more cheaply than something that is brand new, a new innovation that doesn't have that subsidy or doesn't have the benefit of those lower labor costs and material costs. 
And so the way that we can make up for that, it's not, I, I, I would posit that it's not corporate socialism, but it's just appropriate accounting for those costs, for the externalities. When you account appropriately for the, those costs, the, the cost of a gallon of gas should be probably close, closer to, to, to be a wash, to actually be a wash environmentally where we can now you know, um, pay for the damage that we're doing. We should probably be closer to about $12 a gallon. Um, that's the true cost because it's not fair to have the people in the Bahamas lose land. It's not fair to have the people in, in Nigeria uh, suffer from, from uh, illness or disease from exposures. So, so we put all those externalities in, now we can we increase the cost. And what that does is it leaves uh, space in the market for innovation. And, and I put a little side note in here about um, the regulation of capitalist systems. Again, I think I'm a capitalist. I know I'm a capitalist because I know I, I believe in the power of innovation, entrepreneurship, and capital um, to solve problems. It, it, if people say to me all the time, I'm going to tell you this, um, people complain about capitalism. And I get it. It's, it's an imperfect system. It's a made-up system. But let me tell you, I've gone to places that have, have worse versions of capitalist capitalism or have um, not have really non-capitalist systems. If people think the cost of capitalism is great or the environmental ramifications of capitalism are great, they should check out what poverty and uh, other operating systems look like. So it, it's, it's the, the places I go where you have dysfunctional capital markets or don't have capital markets at all, um, uh, the, the environmental degradation is orders of magnitude worse. And uh, so we do have problems, lots and lots of problems, but uh, I do think that, that, the, that ca sometimes capitalism is, is unfairly vilified. What I don't like to see is uh, this idea of total free market capitalism. In my opinion, those, uh, that sort of mindset uh, it ignores the natural systems uh, that, that have shown us to be, that, that regulation is necessary. And so I, I think that we can do better um, and we got to build in regulation. So what's the best mechanism to find solutions to problems in a cost-effective manner? Maybe just out of curiosity, what, what do you think that if I want, if I want to incentivize people to innovate around a problem, what do you think the best way to do that is? How are you measuring best? I want best as in develop technologies, uh, tools, programs, services, products to address problems. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing the answer you're looking for is competition. Um, but I'm not looking for an answer. I know what I would, I know what I'm about to say. I'm just curious what you say. Maybe by listening to the communities who are the most affected by this pollution and listening to what they have to say about it instead of just continuing to bulldoze through it. Okay. Yep, that's, I mean, community engagement, uh, shared management of community resources. I, my experience, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I know I'm going to catch hell for this, but that's okay. I'm good with it. Profit. Profit. The reality is, like it or not, if I ask you how you want to retire one day, maybe you want to retire. I'm close to retirement than all you guys are, I would presume. When I retire, I don't want to get paid in chickens. 
I'd like to get paid in currency, it's fungible currency that I can exchange for goods and services so that I can enjoy the, the, the senior years of my life. The reality is, is that we, we live in a system right now that employs currency as a means uh, to exchange that currency for goods and services. Uh, if, I get, if I get stuck getting paid in chickens and I can't find somebody to buy the chickens that I don't need, then I'm stuck with a bunch of chickens that I don't need that don't do me any good. So money, it's money. Now that we can, Pink Floyd said, and I'm not saying I disagree. I mean, money's the root of all evil, so they say. It's the root of all evil today. But the reality is that um, that's the system that we live in. And we can change the system but that's gonna take a lot of time and there's gonna be a lot of people pushing against it. So what I have learned is if I want to make change and make change fast, I have to give people the opportunity to profit from that change. And, and the reality is, and this is something that is really controversial. I, get, I catch a lot of hell for this and it's okay. By the way, I, I, uh, you guys don't know me, I'm actually, a I'm a pretty nice guy. I'm a, I think I'm a pretty nice guy. I'm like, like I try not to be too offensive or anything like that. I'm, I, I love talking about this stuff and I can, you can totally push back against me, especially if you have me in class, my students, we, we always get matter of fact, I just right before this, right before this talk, I had a student who, who used to argue with me all the time in my class about, about using entrepreneurship and capitalism to solve problems. She just, she's graduated and she just texted me and said, hey, I'm gonna be in St. Louis, we gotta get lunch. She says, I miss our arguments. So anyway, um, what I have found is that the profit motive compels people to innovate about, around a problem. And here's the big, big, big difference between nonprofit um, 501c3 sorts of organizations or traditional nonprofit and for-profit is that it allows people who don't care about the problem to invest in your solution. The, the, the problem with nonprofit sorts of organizations is that to attract somebody to your mission, you, you, you have to, one, you, you typically have to be very conservative in how you innovate because these are agencies in, or in, uh, bureaucracies, they're institutions. Institutionalized community ownership requires a conservative fiduciary, a conservative um, sort of approach um, because the, the community owns them and, and they don't usually change radically. Those organ uh, entrepreneurship is, around, is about revolution. What we do in public health, social work, not that we have to constantly blow shit up, but, but what we should be thinking is about revolutionary change. Entrepreneurship capital markets are around revolutionary change. That's what, that's what entrepreneurship is. Nonprofits have to be careful because they're, they're bureaucracies within, with, that are community owned. And so they can't be constantly being revolutionary because they, they have a fiduciary to the community. The other thing, it's a big difference, is that, 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 <laughs> Not nonprofit, for-profit entities. If we look at the amount of money that's available in capital markets, and we put that in a room that's a hundred feet long, twenty feet tall, and a hundred feet wide, that's our room. Okay. Now we take the amount of money that's available through philanthropy and, non, and, and through foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates and the Wellcome Trust, that amount of money would fill up a three by three by three area in our room. The amount of money that's available for capital investment would fill up the rest of the room. So we all grovel, grovel at the feet of Bill and Melinda Gates, 
of the Bezos uh, money and the, and, and the uh, Welcome Trust. And we all, all of these nonprofits that are trying to solve problems by doing good, we're just doing good, we're just doing good. We all go to the same wells asking for money because we don't want to make any money in return because making money is bad. And, and we, we look for those resources where everybody else is going and, uh, and it pales in comparison to the amount of resources that are available in the, in the capital market. I, we, I, I'm, a, I'm part of a team here that we, we came up with a detector, this tiny little device, it's this big, and it's about this size. It's a wearable, you wear it, and it measures the amount and type of dust that you're being exposed to. That device, um, we were just finishing up a study, uh, actually we believe predicts childhood asthma exacerbations much better than any other technology. Predict, nothing predicts them, but this predicts them pretty well. well. Imagine if this device, which is connected to, but connected to the Wi-Fi, connected to cell, your, your child is wearing this and um, it says, hey, Junior has been exposed or Sally's been exposed to it to a dose that might cause an asthma exacerbation. You might want to administer albuterol if they're at school or whatever, you know, so that we can in so we can pre proactively intervene so that that person doesn't uh, so that child doesn't end up in an emergency room or worse. I could give that away. It's going to I'm going to have a hard time doing that or I can go to Centene, Aetna, uh, insurance companies and say, look, you're feeling this pain. You should buy this service. And then how do I scale up as I go to people and say, look, everybody, I've got Centene, I got Aetna, I've got these people that are now paying for this service. I would like to grow this, uh, this service so that I can provide it more broadly. It's that when you get that capital investment because people want to profit, when you get that capital investment, you can grow and you can grow quickly. And if we wanna solve problems, the problems that we're trying to solve today, these are, these are problems that need solved quickly. And what I have found is that if you wanna attract the capital um, fast, then uh, to, to give people a chance to profit from it, is by far and away the most efficient and effective way to do that. Michael, you got a question, comment? Uh, yeah, maybe both. Um, so I think that, I think like a very important, uh, not to be understated part of all this is, is the bit where you talked about like regulation and, and allowing for innovation, right? If we, if we internalize the externalities and we price those in, then it allows space for innovation. But like, there's a massive amount of non-market work that goes into that regulatory process. And so this whole like market solutions aspect doesn't, doesn't really come into play when there are externalities being thrown around. And, and, and the thing that is like way too slow for uh, the world is this regulatory system and the governance system uh, around internalizing the externalities so that then the market forces of innovation can come to play, right? Yeah, yes, and um, yes. I guess the, the, the yes and part is uh, that it's, Sometimes we use that we use that as an excuse not to innovate. And the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of innovation, a lot of a lot of those changes don't require um, don't require a huge either tax or subsidy. This this device, this device does not. There's no regulatory there's no regulatory um, uh, requirement there that would that would accept that necessarily. I mean, sure, it would be great if I had the regulations there to to um, to subsidize or incentivize the uptake of that technology. But the the in some cases the problems are solvable 
without putting without internalizing the externalities. Well, I mean, I would argue that like the fact that people's healthcare, like that insurers have to cover like basically everything. Right. And that's and that is legislated to some extent. Like that's what makes it possible for market forces to to, you know, to fund your sort of innovation. The fact that insurers can't just say, oh, you have asthma buzz off. They actually have to cover you. That means there's a cost inflicted. So then they have to pay for your device. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, healthcare is, is a, not a real market. So healthcare is a totally different animal altogether because it's the worst of a capitalist system and it's the worst of a socialist system. Take the worst of those two things and you've got healthcare in the United States. Not the best. Don't take the best of those two systems. Take the worst of them. But it's a good point. And it's uh, these are the sorts of things that honestly, in my class, in my classes, we spend a lot of time talking about. So I, I, I think that you're you're hitting it exactly on the head to say, well, where can what are these inflection points? Where can you? Um, what what sectors can you can you use this approach most effectively? Um, because some sectors you need the regulatory help, in some cases you don't. So excellent, good stuff. I mean, these this is what I love, and 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 we only have an hour, but like in a class, typically we would like open up. All right, let's talk about it. Split into small groups, whatever. Let's 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 bird dog this for a little bit. Um, so I think that the, the thing that, uh, first of all, look, I am, can't stress this enough. Like all my businesses, I've never done a business that I don't, well, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I, I Intentionally, I've tried very hard to do businesses that I think do good. And then if I make money or I do benefit, if I benefit from them, I try my very best to be good stewards of that value. Uh, my wife and I, we, we, we try our best to, to facilitate, um, you know, whether it be uh, other new businesses or other, sometimes nonprofit is the only way we can we can affect the change that we want to. So we will obviously invest in those things too. But this isn't to say that we all have to turn into um, to money grabbing, you know, pigs or something like that. No, it's just that that we can leverage this system to. Uh, to be a member of that, that club. What, what's happened, what I've noticed is that people from social work, public health, uh, policy, other areas, we abdicated our spot at the table. We don't play in this space. And if we're not playing in this space, if we're not doing this, then, then, then who is going to represent those voices? Um, and it's again, it's not because there's evil people sitting on boards or things like this. It's just that this lens and, and this problem solving approach isn't present um, because we feel like we have to take a bow of poverty to be in our field. Um, so I think that what we can do is we can be creative. Uh, I work a lot in Australia. We, we've come up with some really interesting uh, ways to bring capital uh, to problem solving through uh, social impact bonds. Uh, that's something that is great. A cap and trade, which Michael mentioned, which is creating markets for, for bad stuff like pollution. Um, it's, it's not the only way, but if you want to bring people, if you want to bring money, the resources to solve a problem, if you want to maximize the resources that you bring, offering a profit or a, a return on investment, um, is an effective way to do it. So I wanted to show you real quick and, I'll let, and then we'll, we'll, I know we got just a few more minutes. I wanna show you how I solve problems. And it's, it's very simple, it's sort of linear. It's uh, probably a too easy of a model to, to think about, but it works for me and it's how I've always addressed problems. Whenever I see a problem in society or in the environment, I tend to focus a lot on environmental problems. Uh, I say, what's the need or the problem? Another way to frame the second question is, who feels the pain of the problem? So who, who has the need or who deals with the problem, but really who's feeling the pain of that problem? And how do they deal with the problem? And then how is my solution superior to how they are dealing with the problem? And then ultimately, how am I superior? 
who is willing to pay for it? Now, really what this is, is once you define who feels the pain of the problem in business parlance, that's the market. Whatever they're doing to deal with the problem, that is your competition. And then how whatever, whatever you're different or the way that you're different, that is your value proposition. And then whoever is willing to pay for it is your customer. You can have a problem. Kids, particularly minority kids, deal with asthma disproportionately. The, those people um, feel the pain of that problem. Their families feel the pain of that problem. What are they doing? What, how are they dealing with that problem? They're going to the emergency room when they get asthma. They're, that's, that's what they're doing. How is our product superior? Our product is superior is that it, it intervenes, it stops that from happening because it's upstream and it can help them predict when asthma is gonna occur and administer uh, albuterol or a, a low cost inhaler beforehand. So that's how our, our um, product is superior. The problem is, is that beneficiary, that person who gets to wear this and gets that benefit, they can't afford to pay for that. So what we have to do is we have to find who is willing to, to pay for that because it is valuable to them. In this case, it's, it's insurance companies. It might be states, it might be school systems, it might be uh, you know, others, but, but that's, that's then who, how we go out and we approach this customer. Oftentimes people attack a market. They think that they need to go to the market. I'm gonna go find my market. That's, that's not how I approach it. I find the customer. I identify customers and I, I pitch it to them. Of course, none of this happens in a vacuum. It all happens in uh, a regulatory environment. It happens in a social context. Um, I can't see that, uh, that screen, sorry. Uh, in, in social and uh, sort of cultural environment that we have to take into consideration. And the other thing is, is that we have to recognize that there are people that are already invested in this. Those, those people could be politicians, they could be uh, social leaders, they could be influencers, they could be, um, they could be you know, village uh, elders in an area I work in where we're, where we're trying to reduce carbon monoxide exposure from cook stoves. Um, you know, people are invested in an old way of doing things. Um, and so you have, to, you have to find a way to get people to disinvest here and invest with your solution. And that's not always easy. And there's strategies around that, but that's how I approach problems. I, I am not saying that it is the only mechanism, but I do believe that in enterprise entrepreneurship and leveraging the way that capitalism works can make a big difference in helping us solve social problem, problems. And I think that that's um, what, um, why we need social entrepreneurs, people who aren't afraid to play in that space will do so fearlessly and, um, and will we'll play, I don't wanna say play the game, but play within, within those operating paradigms to, to affect change. It's not the only way, but I will say this, and, and this, is, this may sound like a humble brag, I don't mean it to, but I'll say this. My last year that I owned Industrial Solutions Group, which was um, the, one of the companies that we owned, um, we, we measured our success, not by how much money we made, but basically by the number of disability adjusted life years or disability adjusted um, productivity days gained, uh, hazardous air pollutants taken out of the air, hazardous uh, water pollutants and, um, and solid waste landfills. So we had four different measures of success. Just with hazardous air pollutants, we, my business, because of our technology, because of what we were, because of what we were able to do, we took out over a hundred thousand tons, 
100,000 tons of the most hazardous air pollutants. I'm not talking particulate. I'm not talking all air pollutants. The, the 80 most hazardous air pollutants, we took out 100,000 tons um, for, in just the United States. And we operated all over the world. And, and we did so by providing value, charging for that value, and then reinvesting in technology to help reduce it further. And, and whether it's that or other things, it's, um, you can still do a lot of, of good that way. So um, I have 223, I don't know, Sarah, if we got time for questions, um, if there's anything else that, that um, people might have or wanna add or push back on or. Absolutely, I, yeah, if any of our uh, admitted students, looks like Maggie has a question in the chat. Yeah, so it says, uh, Maggie, it says, uh, to how, isn't the big question then how this profit motive can be used to tackle root causes of problems? Absolutely, and, and um, it, it's, it's really interesting because there is no free lunch. What one, per one person perceives as a problem, another person may not. Um, and it's a question of what good do we want to do? And this is why, this is what, again, I'm a pariah. I'm, I'm an odd one. Maybe Sarah, you might, you might think better of, of, of inviting me next year because I, I'm, I, I do think that I catch a little heck in, uh, in the social, among the social entrepreneurship uh, field is because I don't, I don't buy the social entrepreneurship narrative usually. By that, I mean, defining good is really difficult. And um, in defining what is a problem is really difficult because some people benefit a lot from what one person would say is a problem. Climate change. Climate change is is unequivocally happening. It is absolutely um, going to cause destruction, death, despair. But there will be people that are going to profit greatly from it. The North Sea is going to open. Cod fisheries in, in Canada and in uh, the, the North are exploding. Uh, shipping routes are now open. Russia stands to benefit greatly from climate change. So does Canada. Uh, is climate change a problem? Yes-ish. So getting some sort of unanimity or understanding of what these problems are and whether or not they're good or bad or whatever, it's hard to get that. So all you can do is say for you as a social entrepreneur, to me, the difference between a social entrepreneur and an entrepreneur is not the definition of good. It's a fidelity to mission. General Electric, you put in their mission, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this, whatever. But they'll change their mission in a heartbeat if it means they can make more money. My mission never changed. And people could say whether that's good or bad. Because let me tell you something. I, I, there was this one company I did work for, um, we, we, we reduced their has, this is a great example, Maggie. Uh, what we did was there's a product, it's an organic peroxide and this, this thing really toxic, really, really dangerous chemical. And it, and it goes, because of its danger, it had to be disposed of in a hazardous waste landfill. And um, the hazardous waste landfill in that area, uh, they, sh they, they shipped um, about, I think it was like $1.2 million a year of this waste to this hazardous waste landfill. We, my company, helped them develop a, a different way to process this, this material and then made it so that it was no longer hazardous. So that's a good thing. Awesome. Great. The hazardous waste landfill, some years later, turns out it went out of business because that was the biggest customer that they had. My company took away their biggest customer, caused 13, 14 people to become unemployed. That was bad for them. But what also happened is they stopped 
following the rules. And then we ended up with a super fun site, uh, a, 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 an environmental disaster where this hazardous waste company operated. I looked back and I'm like, geez, you know, here I thought I was doing good. And what I did was I put a company out of business and it became a super fun site. If you look, if you, if you only focus on the teleological, the downstream, and you try to play it out to the nth degree, it's going to be really, really hard for you to figure out what's good because it's impossible to know. This is why fidelity to mission for me is what matters. A deontological approach, duty bound. That's what I know is right for me at this moment. And yes, it's, it seems like the big question is what you said, root cause. And that's what I focused on. And that's what I do, root cause analysis. And I got books and books on that stuff. But don't, let's not kid ourselves to think that there are, when we do solve problems, that we're not going to create another problem. I see that everywhere I go. So what we want to do is build systems to, to buffet against that and to protect against that and to do really do systems thinking sorts of approaches to problem solving. And there's a class here and there's a professor here, Alice Ballard. Alice is a, um, uh, an expert in social systems design. And I love his work. If you integrate that, that thinking, you're less likely to have follow on problems, but it's a good question. It's what I try to do, but I don't have, I'm not Pollyanna about it. I never, I, I know I'm not gonna make everybody happy. Any other questions, comments? I, I think you, you kind of got me thinking about, I mean, I definitely, you know, agree capitalism or any system is, a, is an operating system, um, but like, there are so many different flavors of capitalism anyway. And so, you know, some of the issues come from like the rugged individualism of our flavor. Um, and that comes from, you know, including like, you know, Joe thinks that this is what needs to happen. And, you know, you're committed to mission and then you make it happen using the, the operating system of capitalism uh, and, you know, downstream effects, et cetera. And, like the system, because like profit for the most part is not tied to, you know, collective good. It's tied to how you manipulate the system to make profit. Basically, anyone making any sort of garbage can be rewarded for it. Um, so it depends on there being just a lot of Joes in the world and a lot of us in the world who are trying to do good. Um, but it strikes me that like if there were you know, socialized or collectivized systems for determining what the proper, you know, like collective goals should be, including even down to the minutia. And then we use the, the system of capitalism. Um, like that seems more reliably something that can address those root causes. Because otherwise, it's just a bunch of people with their individual ideas about what's best, and maybe they're all in conflict, and they can all make money if they know how to use the system. No, it's a really good point. And, and so there's, there's a couple of things. There's the zany bands or the crazy bands or the, the, the capitalism that's around the consumption of things and, and that sort of stuff. I don't know that I ever want to play in that space or get into that space or even talk about that space. It does, it's completely unappealing to me. There will always be people that want... This, this next consumable or want to wear a Rolex. I'm not knocking those people, but that's not, that's not the capitalism I'm interested in. What you said is a good point. And I think it's something that, that when we as a society say, you know what, uh, we wanna reduce the amount of time that kids are in foster home and separated from their families. We know that this has a societal burden. We've done the math. Now, what we can do is, is to solve this problem, which is a $300 million solve, Rather than the state and the taxpayer having to, to, to fund that entirely, what we can do is we can open up a bond, a social impact bond, and if, and, and if the companies or if individuals are willing to invest in a company or an entity, a, social, uh, a nonprofit that's trying to solve this problem, then, then we as a taxpayer base will pay out on that bond. And so there's ways to leverage these, these like you said, the myriad flavors of capitalism um, and and do so in a way that 
attracts investment from beyond the government which if it's a true democracy, it's really, really difficult to get these sorts of investments because, because there's so many needs and there's just not enough taxpayer money to, 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 to go into it. Um, and so if we can attract capital markets to solve the problems, uh, then, then I think that that's a reasonable solution. We can say you can make a 7% return or a 5% return. Um, and, and and still do good. And so I think that your what you said or the way that you're thinking about getting to root cause or in your what you said, Michael, about you know just you know thinking about there's lots of different forms of capitalism. Maybe we don't have to take the most vilified one, but the idea that is frustrating to me or the thing that I've seen in my career is so many people like us find the whole system so repugnant that we don't want to play in it. But then if we're not going to play in it, then how are we going to expect it to get any better, number one? And number two, the truth is, is that, um, you know what, the average nonprofit, no, let me put it this way. There's a statistic, I think it's correct, that 90% of 501c3s in the United States never get to $2 million in revenue. That's an astoundingly low number. 99% never get to $10 million in revenue per year. You know how hard it is to have a, a, a society level impact if you can't get outside of your neighborhood? $2 million doesn't get you very far as an operating budget. And so uh, it's a highly fragmented system um, and, and, uh, and it's an inefficient system, generally speaking. And so that's just my opinion. It's, it's an opinion. It's just informed by my, my experience and it's probably vastly different than everybody else's. But um, I think we're at time. I want to say thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm not as radical as what it would appear, even though my shirt would suggest I'm very radical. Um, but uh, I, I, it's just some ideas to throw out there. This is what we do. This is what we do in graduate school. We should anyway. So... Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Joe, and thank you to our admitted students who joined. This was a really, uh, really engaging conversation, and hopefully, we'll get you all thinking about lots of things as you move on to the next step in your educational journeys. Um, we have more programming tomorrow, so hopefully, we'll see you there. Or if you're watching the recording of this, um, check out other things on the playlist for Admitted Student Week. Yeah, and hopefully, I will say this: that lecture. Is, I think it's a lot more fun in person, um, uh, and most are. So I hope that that you know the very limited amount of engagement we're able to have online. I look forward to meeting you all. It, should you come here, and if not, um, I wish you the, the best and just total success and happiness uh, in in that next phase of your your life and, and studies. So best of luck. Thanks, Joe. See you all later. Have a good day. Bye-bye.